if you're going to talk about China trade and trade with the United States and Asia, you have to start in one place, and that is in Salem, Massachusetts, where it really all began. Uh, and it started uh, during the 1600s and continued on right through to the end of the 1700s and a bit beyond, but not much beyond. It's, it's, a, it's a different history than many people think. And I'm going to talk about a little bit and who the, who the biggest player of them all was uh, during this period was a fellow named Elias Haskett Derby. Uh, he was at the time he was the wealthiest person in America from his from his maritime trade, and I'll talk about how he got there and the history of Salem and how it impacted our our history and our culture in more ways than you might imagine. Because Salem at the time uh, in this early 1600s was one of the oldest uh, earl earliest settlements there was. Uh, it was founded in uh, 1626 and it was incorporated in 1629. And uh, the original inhabitants, the, the English folks that came there, came from my town here on Cape Ann, Gloucester. Uh, Gloucester was discovered by um, Samuel de Champlain um, in the early 1600s, and he originally called Gloucester Beauport. Um, uh, and uh, later it became Gloucester. But uh, in the 1620s, uh, they sent some uh, fishermen down there and under the orders of, of, of the governor and so forth to, to try to do something with the area. And a man named Conant um, was the fellow put in charge of it. He went down there to establish really just a fishing colony, just like they were doing in Gloucester, but uh, going to do it down in Salem. Salem had Salem, Gloucester, and the town Marblehead, which is right next door to Salem, all had ideal harbors for fishing. They were well protected, deep harbors, and pretty much perfect, made to order for North Atlantic uh, fishing boats to come and go safely. They could unload. They were protected from the uh, frequent storms that still come through here, the Northeasters that were so famous for uh, you know the 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 the, uh, uh, the famous sinking of the perfect storm that kind of weather uh, and that's and that's what it's like around here at times so they needed good harbors that could protect ships because the ships were wooden of course and um, couldn't take a lot of beating <laughs> at sea so that that's what was going on and uh, it was Conant who came down here and settled things up and um, this is a, a bronze of him that stands in Salem to this day people often look at it and think it has something to do with the witch trials it doesn't he was the, he was the first uh, he was the he was in charge of the settlement so to speak that came in here and um, interestingly uh, uh, shortly after they came um, and settled and, and, and incorporated the town of Salem in 1629 in 1637 the first colonial military organization in the United States was formed and it was formed in Salem and it's now known as the Army National Guard and that was the first military unit um, uh, officially or militia here in the states and uh, it had it was open to all races uh, it, it, there, there was there was there were no color barriers no religious barriers if you wanted to be in the militia you could be in the militia because it was all considered for the good of the community and even more curiously the next town over Marblehead which was settled at around the same time um, was also a very prosperous fishing village that was where the uh, first ship in the American Navy uh, would come from with its crew and there's a lot of debate about where the American Navy began but it was it was there um, there was it was a ship known as the Hannah and it belonged to General John Glover, who was serving Washington in the war. Washington reached out to him in around 1775 and pressed his, his ship into service as, as, a, as, a, as a naval ship. And they fitted it with guns and did all that. And, and Washington actually paid for it out of his own pocket. Um, he put money into it to make sure it got done. But anyway, back to Salem, maritime history. Um, as, as early as 1643, merchants of Salem were already trading up and down the coastline of the United States, or the colonies, the 13 colonies. And they were going into the West Indies, which were British controlled, uh, much of them at the time, and doing trading there, buying molasses, trading sugar, and all that sort of thing, and then bringing them back up the coastline uh, uh, along the United States and going into sordid ports and selling things. Um, back then, ships were sort of like, like um, floating shopping malls, more or less. Uh, they had a fellow on board known as the Supercargo, and he was doing deals from port to port. Some, some ports, they would hold things back and wait for the next port because the prices they heard were better. And there was a lot of this wheeling and dealing, and they'd be in one port, sell a bunch of stuff, and then take other goods on that they could sell maybe somewhere up the coast for a bigger profit. And this was how trade was committed. And it was done this way all the way up to around 1700. Uh, and by then, Salem was becoming quite a prosperous town, um, as was Marblehead. 
and as was Gloucester. Uh, these were booming um, fishing and maritime trade communities. They had uh, a, a lot of sea captains living in them, a lot of people who wanted to make their lives on the seas, and there was an endless, endless uh, supply of people that wanted to go to sea and make their fortunes because it was such a lucrative way to do it. Um, uh, trading in the ocean was extremely dangerous. But it was also extremely profitable and, and uh, um, it paid a lot better than working on a farm. All right. So from 1700 to about 1763, China, uh, the trade in Salem, maritime trade continued to expand. More ships were added to the fleets. More goods were bought and sold, dried codfish, all this sort of thing. But you'll notice they're not going to China. And um, this, this, is, this will explain why in a little bit. But at this time, Salem and, and all other American ports um, were uh, actually prohibited from going to Asia. Uh, they, if they were going to, uh, uh, planning on going uh, to do business there, they'd be cut off by the British. The British East India Company held an absolute monopoly over the colonies on where they could, couldn't go. And it was all sort of controlled um, under the Navigation Act of 1651, which um, uh, basically gave all of the power to the British government and they could dictate where and when ships within their colonies could go and do business. And one thing they didn't want them doing was trying to go to China and cutting them out as the middlemen. The, British, the Brits always wanted to be the middlemen for every deal. Every dollar that got exchanged, they wanted a piece of it. And, um, and, that, and that was just how it was. And the North American British colonials were required to purchase all of their Asian goods as a result through the British. And uh, there, there was no independent engaging of trade. None of that was allowed. And uh, it was upsetting to, the, to them because they knew how lucrative it was. They'd heard stories and they realized what they're paying for things and they could do so much better if they could go there, but it wasn't allowed uh, for the time being. And then we're gonna turn our page over and talk about the Derby family because they're the, the ones that really um, were, the, were the powerhouse catalyst behind the opening of trade, um, um, uh, not only to Asia and China and India, but also um, uh, all over Europe. And, um, uh, and it began with Richard Derby, not Elias Haskett, his father, Richard. Richard was born in 1712, and um, he went to sea at a very young age. He came from a sort of a, a working middle class family, um, doing okay, but he went to sea on a fishing boat, and he, and he and he he went at a young age. I think he was ten or twelve years old when he first went to sea, and uh, um, worked as a cabin boy, worked his way up through the ranks, and uh, eventually he became a ship's master and eventual owner of several ships. And he went on many successful voyages up and down the east coast of the United States to the West Indies. Eventually, he went to Spain, Portugal, and so forth. And in 1730 at the age of 24, this is a young guy, he was already the master of the sloop ranger that was sailing from um, uh, sailing out of Salem and uh, he took it to uh, uh, southern Spain to Cadiz and Malaga and uh, and then uh, he was the uh, part owner of another ship called the Volant in 1742 and uh, he took that to Barbados and the French Isles and this is what he did. This was his business. He was going on with his ships, buying and selling goods, bringing them back. He had partners, investors, and it was all very lucrative. And uh, by 1757, he had made a fortune. Um, he'd made a, a very large fortune. He was very successful, and he had decided to retire from sea life. Um, he was around 45 years old, and he decided he'd, he'd, he'd just had enough of it, and he wanted to become a merchant, uh, an on-land merchant, and uh, but keep keep his hand in the shipping world so he owned he owned a fleet of ships but he didn't go anymore himself he, he had a large family a lot of obligations and it was a risky business it was an easy way to get a lot of captains didn't come back they got killed if they did come back they usually were rewarded handsomely for their efforts they made a lot of money uh, many sea captains retired completely after just one or two trips to china uh, into the into into the indian ocean uh, doing trading trips because it was so lucrative all right but at any rate he retired he came back and um, he began building his the derby maritime empire from salem uh, by then even further and it was already quite a well-established company it was very well established and during this time he built the famous derby wharf which is today still in salem and it was added on to continuously um, over the period of about 30 or 40 years. By the time they were done building it out, by around 18, 1800, 1810, it was a half a mile long sticking out into Salem Harbor. And on it were a bunch of warehouses. There were 20 or 30, 20, 24 warehouses, uh, or 25 warehouses, and buildings and counting houses and all this to receive goods coming off of all of the Derby ships 
uh, because they were always coming and going. It was a constant flow. They owned several dozen ships at this point. And these were uh, significant cargo ships, and they were all doing significant amounts of business. And they had uh, about 100 captains for them at one point and um, working on different ships and doing all kinds of things. At any rate, they had built this wharf out into the harbor. They were handling this flood of cargo that was coming in, selling it. Some of it they would package up and send back down to Boston or New York, Philadelphia, or to Charleston, uh, uh, Charleston uh, the Carolinas, um, but always seeking a new market always seeking, and, and sending ships overseas. And it's important to keep in mind that during the 1600s and in, in the 1700s, um, uh, the, 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 the British allowed a lot of leeway, a lot of autonomy to the colonies because they figured they were all loyal to the crown and they're trying to build something. And they were um, uh, well known for their industriousness, especially in New England. They were very industrious people, hardworking. Lots of people had, they had lots of skills, cabinet makers, uh, uh, carpenters, ships carpenters, um, uh, people that could prepare foods, textiles all of it they were doing all of it here so it was it, everything was going along pretty well and they were able to handle huge volumes of goods coming and going out of the colonies and the crown was of course getting a duty on all of it they had they had offices of taxation that took their share as everything came in and, and it was going along extremely well um, Salem was shipping out uh, you know dried fish lumber all of it very profitable and uh, meanwhile, they were building up the infrastructure of the, of the new, new nation, and the Brits weren't putting in much money into it. It didn't really cost them anything. And this was, these people were very self-supporting and um, uh, d doing things the, you know, uh, uh, themselves. So the British sort of left, gave it a hands-off um, uh, approach to it. Uh, the only the only limitations were things like the Navigation Act of 1651 that was preventing them from uh, the traders going from Salem, for example, over to China. They could go to Europe, but they couldn't go to China. All right, and. Um, and, and by the 1760s, uh, you know, after a couple of hundred, after 150 years of this, uh, the, the, the colonists wanted more and more trade. They wanted to expand their reach and uh, they wanted to go to China. They wanted to go to India. They wanted to go to these places, but they couldn't. And it was very frustrating. And uh, uh, the, the, there was a, uh, the beginning of the revolution. The, by the 1760s, six, mid-60s, people were getting frustrated. They were tired of the king uh, imposing things at random. But the thing that really started to break the camel's back was at the end of the Seven Years' War, uh, which ran from 1756 to 1763. And by the end of the war, the Great Britain had, had ran up an enormous tab. They owed a lot of money. Um, um, uh, for, for, to pay for the war. And they, for some reason, decided that the, 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 the colonists, uh, who were already paying significant duties and taxes and all kinds of things on everything that was coming in, they needed to pay more. They had to pay more for what they were getting, and they should be glad that we defended them, is what the, sort of the attitude was. And it resulted in the implementation of the Grenville Townsend Acts, um, that were issued a series of acts that were issued between 1764 and 1768 to raise taxes on new taxes on duties and um, everything that was shipped. Anything that went on a boat got a new tax on it, and it was becoming prohibitive. They were having a hard time at this point um, dealing with it and, ma and, and making money, you know, ma staying ahead uh, enough so that you had a good profit. And, 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 the, and the British Crown was saying, no, we want the money, we're going we're gonna to grab it. And then they made it worse in 1765 when they when they the Brits passed the Stamp Act. You may have heard of that. And basically, it was a levy that was on paper. It was a lever that's, levy that said, you know, any, anything on printed paper, newspapers and things like that, printed documents, you had to pay a tax to have those, an extra special tax just for things on paper. And the, and the colonialists were outraged. They were furious and they refused to pay it. There was a lot of discontentment over it. And eventually, within a couple of years, the British retract rescinded that. They got rid of it because it was causing way too many problems in the colonies. Uh, the people here were furious and they were afraid of an uprising. And uh, they had every reason to be afraid of an uprising because there was a lot of talk at that time, even 10 years before the revolution started, that something had to be done. A change had to be had to be begun. And um, the, but, the, but, the, but the Townsend Act remained in force. And uh, to enforce it, the British did the ham-handed thing that they've been known to do. Uh, they sent troops to Boston. 
and to quell to quell troublesome um, colonial the colonists people that were speaking out they were they had the military there sort of as a threat to go on to go everybody and uh, it, uh, over time the expression no taxation without representation began um, coming on as the battle cry um, to, to, to to how fed up they were with the British crown and uh, the ideas of independence began surfacing in conversations uh, people began writing about it talking about it openly and this b made the uh, the Brits very, very nervous. And uh, this went on for a number of years until February of 1775. And uh, it was, it's an interesting story. This is actually one of the funniest stories. It was that you've all heard the story of um, the Concord and Lex the Battle of Concord and Lexington, or Lexington and Concord, depending on how you want to say it, um, which was, is, is historically considered to be the first battle of the Revolutionary War. It almost wasn't the first battle of the Revolutionary War. It was almost um, uh, two months earlier in Salem. And uh, it was on February 26, 1775. And what happened was, was that um, there was a, a group of rebels, um, people, militia, um, up in the Salem area, uh, backed by the Derbys and other people who, um, remember that militia that they formed back in the, in the 1600s? Well, it had grown. And there were 10, 12,000 people now in the militia in the Salem, Danvers area. Um, which is, Danvers is another town which is right next to Salem, and uh, Marblehead and all these towns. And they had a significant militia. It was no joke. And they had also, uh, uh, General Gage, who was working for the British in Boston, learned that they had somehow acquired 19 cannons. And cannons were considered to be very dangerous at the time because one cannon can sink a very expensive British ship. It all has to do is broadside it or take out the sails, you can capture the ship, and uh, the British didn't want any of that. So uh, General Gage told uh, a, a fellow named Colonel Leslie um, to uh, get up to, uh, go up to Marblehead on a boat and march, take, some, take the 64th Regiment with you, march across into Salem, and uh, get those cannons away from those guys. You can't have cannons, get the powder, get everything. Get all their weapons. If they've got rifles, get the white rifles, but mostly get the cannons. And uh, Colonel um, Leslie did that. He, he went up to Marblehead, brought everybody ashore, and started marching them. What he didn't know was that this was on a Sunday, and what he didn't know was that all these towns suspected something might be coming. So they had arranged a signal uh, uh, deal between them um, where they would ring the church bells a certain way if the British came. Okay, and they called them regulars. And uh, uh, the British regulars showed up um, on the backside of Marblehead. They were marching in. The, the, they went to the church bells. They rang the bells. The people in Salem heard it. They rallied the militia. And um, there was a, there's a place in Salem known as the North Bridge. And uh, it, it just goes over a little body of water from one side to the other, but you need to cross it to get there. And it was a drawbridge. And the militias were on one side, and the British... The British uh, regulars came in on the other, but fortunately for the for the for the militia, the um, mechanism to draw the bridge was on their side. So what they did was they pulled the bridge up, and now you had uh, uh, Le uh, Colonel Leslie, who was not a mil he was not a, any war hero. He was a he was a he was a you know sort of an armchair officer of the day, and he was on the other side demanding that they put the bridge down, and he wants the cannons. And uh, it, 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 Richard Derby Jr., um, the, the son of uh, the, the founder of the Derby Company, um, uh, stood on the other side and yelled at him very famously about the cannons. Find them if you can, take them if you can. They will never be surrendered. And uh, Colonel Leslie was afraid of this. He, he, he realized that these guys weren't fooling around and it would be pretty unwise um, uh, to, for them to try to force the issue because um, this was coming from one of the derbies and everybody knew who the derbies were and they had the most to lose. They had a lot to lose if this thing fell apart. And uh, the problem was, was that they began discussing across this waterway, this little gap between the two bridge, where the bridge was, and Leslie was explaining to them that he has to come over because he can't lie to General Gage. He has to come over and try at least try to get them. So what they did was they concocted a scheme with the colonists who said, okay, we're going to put the bridge down, and what you're going to do is you're going to march your troops across the bridge. You can go 50 paces up the road, if you don't see any cannons, you're going to turn around and leave and go back. And then you can tell um, General Gage that you um, uh, came to the area, you, you looked uh, on, on the North Street area, which is where they suspected the, the cannons to be. You didn't find them, and uh, that's all there is to it. There were no cannons. And uh, they all agreed to it, and uh, that's exactly what happened. And uh, Colonel Leslie marched across the bridge with some of his troops. I don't know if all of them, but he marched some of them across to put on a show. And the, the 
the militia parted for them and let them through. Nobody fired a gun. Nobody, nobody stabbed anyone. And they walked up the street and they did this sort of uh, uh, show inspection. Didn't see any cannons, so they left. And that was the end of it. And then Colonel Leslie could go back and, uh, uh, with a straight face, say he didn't see any cannons, and he did cross the bridge into, in, onto North Street in, in, in Salem, looking for them. And uh, it was it was all sort of a silly thing. And now, of course, in April 19th of 1775, just a couple of months later, um, the the shot heard around the world. The Battle of Lexington and Concord took place. And uh, as you know, the, at that point, the, the war was on. All right, so now let's talk about Elias Haskett Derby, who came along in the middle of all this. He was born in 1739, and he died in 1799. He didn't live very long. He lived 61 years old, but he was destined to become the foremost American merchant of his time, by far, by far. And he, But he had never gone to sea. He never went to sea in his life. His brothers did. And his father had, but he didn't. His, his strength was in his business skill. He was a brilliant, brilliant businessman. He had a keen mind for mathematics, a keen mind for accounting. He had a very good understanding of uh, marine architecture and how to design ships. And he spent his time doing that. He hired, you know, they hired the very best navigators. They hired uh, uh, the, the, the very best shipwrights. And they, they built ships all over the place uh, using the latest technology for the fastest ships possible, the lightest, fastest ships they could build. And uh, he basically, for the company working for his dad, basically was the keeper of the books. He conducted all their correspondences. He took care of the, the personal accounting for everybody in the family because there were a number of brothers and sisters. They'd all been given lavish uh, Salem houses, mansions, uh, beautiful homes, absolutely spectacular. Many of them are still up today. And um, and he took over the wharves. He, he orchestrated the extension of Derby Wharf as it went along. And uh, he very much had the spirit of his father as far as business goes. But he was, a, he was an even sharper uh, mind. He, he, he was able to see things when others couldn't. And he was willing to take risks that were calculated but would probably work. All right, and, and, and during this time, um, between 1760 and 1775, before the revolution began, he was doing lots of business um, with, with the British. He was doing business with the French. He was, he was doing business um, throughout uh, uh, the, uh, uh, West, uh, the, East, uh, the West Indies, um, you know, the Caribbean, and in Europe. And everything was going along really, really well. And he also had made, his people had made significant contributions to, to shipbuilding um, uh, for other um, uh, 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 maritime operators at the period. All right, and, and during the revolution, when the revolution came along, he loaned the government money. This is how much money he made. He made so much money he could loan it to the government to help fund the war, sort of the way the Rothschilds were known to do years ago. He provided boats for the troops to move around on. Um, and a lot of sailors on the North Shore um, uh, contributed to that. For example, the, the famous portrait of George Washington crossing the Delaware that boat and that storm, um, when they wanted really tough guys to handle that boat and all that ice, because it was a very dangerous thing to do, what they did, it was considered brazen at the time, were all crewed by guys from Marblehead, Mass., the next town over. They were also privateers and um, wild sailors, but because they had been involved with the Hannah early on and General Glover, they, they, Washington wanted Marblehead guys to um, bring them across the river. Um, in the ice that time, in, in that famous photo, in that famous painting, which is which is this, all right. And then he also extensively and successfully engaged in privateering against the British. Um, uh, 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 Elias Haskett Derby made a fortune privateering once the Revolutionary War got underway. Uh, they attacked and sacked many, many ships. They had in Salem by then. They had armed their uh, their boats, and there were roughly 158 um, privateers operating out of Salem. Salem. And uh, during that time, they, they, they captured uh, around 600 British ships, took, took their contents, they, they were known as prizes when you took a ship, and you got to keep the cargo. And um, this, was, uh, uh, this was the life of the privateer and s sailing um, under the, the letter of the mark. This was, this was uh, the, 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 your power, was that you were allowed to be a pirate. And uh, this went on throughout the revolution, and of course the revolution wound down and ended, and uh, the negotiations were done for peace, and so forth. And uh, by the end of the war, the, Has the Derbys were sitting on vast amounts of money. Um, they had these beautiful ships. They had built several large ships toward the uh, uh, end of the revolution. One of them was the uh, Grand Turk, and the other one was the uh, a few a little shortly after the Estrella. 
And um, they had a new problem, though, and they and they had to, uh, which was that they could no longer trade in the um, West Indies they, they, because the British controlled them and they lost the war. They were cut off from doing trade there. So sailors like Elias Haskett Derby had to, some decisions to make. And um, during this time, he decided to send some of his bigger ships over and he opened up trade in St. Petersburg and Russia. Um, uh, they sent ships to, to Europe and do, to do trade and all this. And uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of documents that, that were produced uh, to explain how active they were. And uh, for example, uh, between 1785 and 1799, in just 14 years, Elias Capiscuit Derby sent 37 different vessels on 125 voyages. 45 of them were to the East Indies or China, all right, and, and, and which all brought back tons of goods and uh, millions and millions and millions of dollars of goods. In 1791, he embarked on a regular trade with India. And uh, 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 this was a, a, a real uh, breakthrough. And uh, this, after this, his ships made many, many um, uh, foreign port visitors visits in that part of the world. Now, the 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 the, the uh, uh, Derby fleet was not the first boat to go to uh, the first boat to go out and go to China and Asia. It was actually a a, a boat uh, that was called the Empress of China, and it was not a big ship. People think of these ships as like you see in the movies, these big square. Riggers. No, the, the 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 Empress of China was a, was a small ship. It was only 63 feet long, and um, it had about as much storage space as a couple of boxcars. That was it. It couldn't carry a lot of cargo, but it was the first. And um, as soon as that ship left, um, Elias Haskett Derby began making plans to send his own ship, which was the Grand Turk. And uh, by the time the Grand Turk got over there, the, the Empress of China was already coming back and they met um, um, around South Africa. The captains talked, um, the, the, the Derby captain was encouraged to go on. There's a lot of wealth to be made, a lot of good business to be done in that part of the world. And they did, and they did. And uh, they, they, they based themselves out of the Isle of France, which is which is now now known as Mauritius, which is a, it's off the coast of Africa, but is in this below the Indian Ocean, but good access to everywhere else, and it was an ideal staging point to do it. And uh, the French wanted them there because the French were friends of the U.S. after all, because they'd been a good ally during the Revolution, and they liked seeing the Americans uh, do well, especially if it encroaches on the British a little bit, because there was that endless hatred between the French and the British. All right, so anyway. That that's what went on, but it was it was a very difficult period um, um, of adjustment for them. The interesting thing is that uh, during the uh, 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 revolution, when it was first getting going, Elias Haskett Derby was still trying to do regular trade as much as possible. But they kept grabbing his ships, so eventually he began um, uh, realizing he needed bigger, more powerful ships and more armed ships, and they did do that, and that was part of the way they built up the privateers. But at any rate, to, to meet all the, uh, the requirements for this, he, like I said, the, he had, had the Grand Turk built and the uh, Estrella, uh, which was a little bigger than the Grand Turk. It was about, about 100 feet long, 300, 320 ton ship, something like that. Uh, pretty good size. And um, it was sailed under commissioned of the letter of the mark, which means they could legally privateer, uh, privateer until the war was over. And then it became a trading vessel. And eventually, um, uh, uh, the, this, the number of Salem privateers by the end of the war was enormous. It was enormous. They had they had they had more of them, and 25 or 30 of them belonged to the Derbies alone, um, and they were among the most successful. Uh, the Grand Turk took 16 British ships during the Revolution, um, and the and the, and the uh, many other families also did very very well during the uh, the, the Revolution and and afterwards. But Elias Haskett Derby pro prospered the most. And uh, as a result, largely of privateering and so forth. All right. So now you get on. You've you've got the Empress of China has gone over there. Elias Haskett Derby has sent the Grand Turk on his first big ship, and um, and and now now what? Well, you keep sending ships is what, and they did, and they sent many many ships over back and forth while doing other trading around Europe. But they went to uh, China, and they they bought uh, uh, you know tea, pepper cotton and so forth um, from um, India, uh, silks, and all the places that the British had had almost exclusively, um, they were now able to go into. And the only port in China really opened to them at this time was Canton. Uh, 
um, uh, the, for the certain seasons when they were allowed in under the uh, Chinese trading rules, which was fine. The Americans were okay with that. They didn't complain about it. And the Chinese, as a result, actually liked a lot of the American traders better than they liked the British traders because the Americans were nicer to them. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't insult them. Um, they they were more polite. Uh, there was a little more gentlemanly behavior. There was a uh, between the difference between the Americans and the Brits. Um, the, the, the Americans uh, were very appreciative, and uh, many American traders over the next 60 years, up until 1850, uh, built uh, very strong relationships um, with, with Chinese merchants. Some of them actually got money from Chinese merchants who wanted to invest in America. Um, I think it was Huqua wanted to invest in the railroads, and he gave um, um, one of the Boston captain families, uh, the, the Forbes, uh, I think it was Murray Forbes, um, gave him $200,000 to invest in the railroads. <laughs> Uh, so there was there was a, a lot of friendship there, and um, and as I said, the French were more than happy to stick it to the British a little bit uh, uh, to uh, uh, you know help the Americans make some money. Uh, one of the biggest problems that uh, the Derbies were facing and other Americans were facing, though, when they began trading, especially in China and Asia, was that the, uh, the banking system in America really wasn't established yet. And uh, generally speaking, when they went to these ports to trade, uh, the, uh, the countries, India and in China in particular, they didn't want goods. They wanted silver. They wanted specie. They wanted they wanted they wanted to be paid in cash, so they had to come up with the products that would would be enticing enough that the Chinese would say, okay, fine, don't pay us, we'll take these these goods in its place. And um, what happened when the uh, Empress of China sailed was they discovered uh, the main cargo that they took with them to trade in China was um, uh, ginseng. Um, uh, the uh, ginseng root was enormously popular in China. Um, they believed that it would help cure smallpox. I remember reading somewhere once that they, the, the, there was a smallpox outbreak and that ginseng would help combat it, so the Chinese wanted to buy ginseng. The only problem with ginseng was that the prices were very uneven. And um, if, if, if you came in behind two ships that had just delivered some ginseng, you might not get much for your cargo after sailing ha literally around the world. So it was a little bit risky. They tried trading um, uh, you know, uh, uh, dr dried fish, furs, all kinds of things, and, and eventually they, they built it up, and eventually people like the Derbies uh, built banking relationships in Europe. Their ships were able to go into different ports into Spain, pick up Spanish, Spanish silver to take um, to trade uh, um, in uh, Asia for goods, and, and over time, the, 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 market, the marketing and the, and the finances around the world smoothed out considerably, and they were able to do trade on a, on a pretty steady basis anywhere they wanted to go. All right, and um, but in at the beginning it was mostly barter. You traded something for what they had. They, they you know, and it was a lot of negotiating that went on. But it did it did work. It did work. And during these years, while the larger Derby vessels were on voyages to the east and, and, and to Asia, the smaller ships were still cruising up and down the coastal areas of the United States. The big ships like the Turk and the, and the Astria were too big for that. They were physically too big to do it effectively. They, they were deep ocean boats and they were meant to go long distances. And they were very quick. These were fast boats, so um, they were they were the happiest at sea. And uh, as privateers, they were amazing because the British didn't have ships who could catch them. So they could they could raid a British ship, strip its cargo, um, and um, just sail off. And uh, they would they would sail off so much faster than the British ships um, that, that they were never in danger of getting sunk most of the time. Occasionally, they would capture one. Uh, the Brits would capture one of them, but it, it didn't happen all that often. But it happened enough. Uh, that it, it was a concern, of course. So there we are, and uh, we we go now out to the the uh, uh, f the fall of 1789, for example. And there's a letter that was written uh, saying that uh, uh, at that time uh, w somebody was in the po port of Wampoa, the anchorage. That's the anchorage area for Canton, and um, it was reported that four of Derby's four Derby had four ships in that harbor, uh, cargo ships waiting to load up, but also in Wampoa so quickly were 11 other American ships already. Now, keep in mind that they had nobody had gone there until until six years earlier. And now there are 15 ships from the United States, not including, you know, France and England and Holland, and all these other places, just 15 from the United States alone at one time in, in, in Canton waiting to load up and, and do business. And that just shows you how rapidly uh, it expanded interest down the coastal United States, down to uh, Providence, Rhode Island, became a big shipping uh, spot 
uh, New York City, Philadelphia, Charleston, South Carolina. All these these towns ended up putting ships to sea to go to China and to go to Asia because it wasn't only about Chinese and Chinese porcelain. We like to think it was, but it was really about everything over there. The riches, the spices, the teas, um, the, the, the cotton from India, the silks, all of the products from all of the cultures in that part of the world were of enormous interest to the people in the Americas, not just China. All right, they they, had the, the, were, they were known, of course, mostly for the you know the very fine porcelain that they were making and beautiful lacquerware and that kind of thing. But there were lots of other products that they, everybody was equally interested in, and that's what made it happen. If it was just for China, it wouldn't have been anywhere near as active as it was. But but the fact was that you go to that part of the world and you had exposure to so many different products at bargain prices, relatively speaking, and there, that's why they went because the markups were enormous. All right, and uh, but from the beginning it was just ginseng. I'll give you some idea. By 1790, a total of uh, 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 two million six hundred and one thousand pounds of tea was imported um, in one year. Okay, in one year, two million pounds, two and a half million pounds into just the United States. And amazingly, 728,000, almost 729,000 pounds of it was carried on Derby ships aboard just two ships, the Astrea and another uh, powerful ship they had called the Light Horse. And two of the vessels were at Canton uh, the previous autumn, and that's what they came back on their own. So f almost 350,000 pounds of tea on each ship, plus massive quantities of other things, spices, silks, porcelain, cotton, um, herbal remedies, and all that other stuff that they would bring back. So it was, as you can see, that it was enormously profitable. And keep in mind, tea was very expensive. Tea, tea was considered the ultimate in the, uh, in, in the 1790s, was considered to be the ultimate luxury product. Um, and that's where the little tiny tea caddies have locks on them because they didn't want the servants stealing them. All right, so at any rate, as, as luck would have it, by the 1790s, France and England was again embroiled in another war, and it was a titanic struggle between them. The United States did what it could to remain sort of neutral and conduct keep con so they could keep conducting business between the two places, and it was fairly successful. Um, uh, the, they, they, they had some trouble with the British. The British were raiding their ships. They went to them and negotiated, look, we'll su help supply you with the things that you need during this war, but you have to leave us alone, and they issued the treaty, the J Treaty, as it was called, of 1794, and it somewhat reduced the, the friction between the United States and, and, and England, but wasn't perfect. But the other side of it was that it also irritated the French, because the French had, had given the U.S. Uh, trading ships a few years earlier access to the Isle of France to do business. They had been our good, close alloy, Lafayette, and all that during the Revolution, and now we are make, here we are making um, deals with the British um, um, in, sort of in it's sort of an insult to the French. And that's the way it was going, all right. And uh, but it 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 worked out and, and so forth. In the 1790s, uh, Elias Haskett Kirby didn't send many ships. There were very few ships at that point coming from Salem going to to China. Uh, other 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 ports were sending them. Now there's a lot of competition, and they were looking for more profitable ways to do business. So they they they, they a handful of ships went out of Salem to China during the 1790s. But that was about it. And then by about 1798, 1799, um, Salem, though, was having trouble with its ships being taken by the Brits, being harassed at sea, and they decided they needed to build a new ship um, with the government, and they had to raise money privately to do it, because they did, the government didn't have much money at that point. The, you know, the country was basically bankrupt, if you think back to your history from that time period. Um, and Elias Haskett Derby put up $10,000 to build the ship, the Essex. It cost seventy-four thousand to build, but he, he he immediately headed the list of subscribers. Then when they would go around and talk to wealthy people who would be willing to contribute, he was the first to put his name on. He put ten thousand dollars up right away, and uh, some say he would have put he would have maybe even paid for all of it if he had to, because he had that much at stake. But anyway, they raised the seventy-four thousand and they built the frigate Essex, which was a thirty-two gun ship, um, very able, and uh, went on to have years of service after that. And uh, it was just an amazing period. When you consider that between 1784 and 1799, um, uh, Her Derby uh, employed roughly 100 sea captains and utilized about 90 or so different ve vessels. He ended up with the nickname King Derby and uh, made a total of around 336 voyages on his ships in 15 years, 
223 in foreign trade, 113 coastal trips up and down the, the seaboards. Now, keep in mind, these ships are filled with goods. They're going to be sold at giant and giant profit margins. Um, uh, so it was really something. And uh, 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 Salem, uh, at this point, uh, accounted for about 25% of the total uh, Salem tonnage registered in, in, in uh, total tonnage registered in trade during this time. Um, he, he was a uh, he, he. In other words, he was responsible for about 25 percent of the total total business um, of the town, which was significant. It was very very significant, and um, it, it went on it went on um, uh, for a number of years longer. But it did start to wind down as other ports began trading and competing. Um, demand prices dropped. More goods were coming in from China. The values weren't as strong as they were, so they began looking for other areas to trade. But the Derby era, by, by around uh, 1800, 1810, was pretty much winding down. They were very rich. They weren't out of money, but they, they had the, their options for trading and doing things weren't what they'd been 20 years earlier. They'd been sort of priced out of the market, so to speak. And by 17, um, but by the 1790s, Salem, Massachusetts was by far the, the wealthiest per capita town in America. And some believe it was the wealthiest, for a brief time, it was the wealthiest per capita town in the world. Uh, because they had a small population and everybody, um, a large number of the population was rich. Elias Haskett Derby was the first millionaire in America, as a matter of fact. And um, as, I, as I, I think I mentioned, was that the, uh, I said to somebody, I said that there was a historian that said that to understand how much power and wealth Mr. Derby had accumulated, that it, it was more or less the equivalent of having 30, in today's dollars about $35 billion dollars. Which was unheard of, in, you know, that kind of wealth in the in the uh, in the 18th century, but he did it, and uh, uh, he he had a quite a legacy, and it went on. Um, at any rate, after the 1790s went by, things began to quiet down. The Salem's Customs House was seeing uh, fewer and fewer taxes. And Salem went into a bit of a depression after that, but after the War of 1812. They did a bit of more privateering in the War of 1812, but things really quieted down. Um, and, and their business, a lot of the business that had been done out of Salem was now being done out of Boston. Um, ships were getting enormous. Um, uh, the Forbes families, the Perkins families, um, the, 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 the Browns in Rhode Island, the Duns in Philadelphia, all these shipping families by the 1840s and 50s had these massive ships. Uh, some of them had permanent offices over there uh, at that time. Uh, the Duns did in Philadelphia. Um, he, actually, Mr. Dunn was over there for about a decade uh, building up. He was working trade from that end back to Philadelphia. And uh, but it, but it all began um, it all began really with Salem. The, the 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 Empress of China proved you could do it, but it wasn't a particularly profitable trip. The ship was too small, took too long, expenses were too high, but um, the Derbies uh, uh, really showed how it should be done, and uh, how they did their trade, how their ships sailed and traded all over the world, up and down coastlines, uh, traded up and down the coast of Africa, traded up and down all over India and China, Canton and so forth and uh, constantly moving, constantly doing business, and then bringing uh, whatever we, they needed to back to America. And uh, it was just an absolutely incredible period of time. And when you look around today and you see all of the, uh, the influences in your daily lives, uh, from, from, you know, you call your dinner dishes China because that's where the plates came from, China. Um, um, printed, printed cottons, uh, palampores, silks, uh, salt, peppers, all the things we use around our houses every day, Japan furniture, and the lacquered p furniture, all of that, uh, all of that comes from China. All of that comes from China and Asia, Japan, that part of the world, and it started in, in this period uh, as far as America is concerned. So it's quite fascinating, and I hope you enjoyed this. All right, and if you did, subscribe and uh, give us a thumbs up, leave a comment, and uh, thank you so much for watching. It's an interesting time. Bye-bye.